Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you've all been able to partake in some of the food that was outside. Uh, we did say in some of the information that was circulated that we would start at 12.30, uh, others said 12.15. So we're going to talk for maybe two minutes uh, by manner of introduction so that we can start at 12.30 sharp. Uh, my name is Michel Hooks. I'm director of the new Institute for Asia and Asian Studies. Uh, this is our final event of the semester in terms of events that, that, that we have initiated and organized. We are extremely happy and grateful that we have been able to work together for this event with Notre Dame Press and with NEIAS. Very, very grateful for your support. Uh, and we're grateful to all of you for the support you have given us throughout the past academic year in attending to our events, working with us, uh, applying to our, for our funding, coming to our classes, and so on and so forth. So thank you very much. Um, my task today is to introduce uh, the chair of our panel. Uh, I'm delighted to do so, Professor Lionel Jensen, who is a uh, professor in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures, as well as in the Department of History, uh, who is an outstanding scholar of the encounter between China and the West in many different aspects, including the aspect of religion. Um, and I want to take this occasion to thank him also to recognize the wonderful work he has done over many years in building I didn't know Asian <laughs> studies at the University of Notre Dame and continuing to support the Dio Institute. So I would like to hand over to Professor Jensen with a warm applause from all of you. So thank you for getting started a little bit early, which makes me very happy. So I wanted to uh, first say that this is, I think, an especially suitable moment for us to convene a forum on not only the church in China, but in a more broad sense, the very different Chinas that there are, the uh, churches find themselves in, because China is a very polyvalent and, if you will, multitudinously complex place. It's a spectacle unto itself. And we don't always have it that way. So in this vibrant religious universe that we call China, it's wise, I think, to avoid making too much of what has come across in the headlines in recent months and the discussions between the Vatican and Beijing. Our panel will touch on some of these matters, but We'll also be talking more broadly about religion in China and the rather vibrant quality of religious life in China. At the same time as we also then turn to and address the specifics of the recent developments that remain in many ways not quite uh, clear. And so I want to offer some, a kind of suggestion that I'm very happy we're all here and I'm also happy to have the four people who are with us here today to speak. They all have overlapping disciplinary exuberances, anthropology, history, sociology, religion, theology, and a great deal of personal experience traveling and living in various parts of, of China, as we uh, call it today. And this breadth, I think, is appropriate, and I think instead maybe better than appropriate, it's essential to the study of a religious state, which is what John Elijah Wade has called China, and I believe it's a very appropriate formulation. So let me first introduce Michel Chambon, and I'm going to offer a little bit of his standard blurb, but he's the French Catholic theologian and a cultural anthropologist who studies Chinese Christianity. His research explores various denominations evolving across the Chinese world today, and focuses on the role of materiality in the making of Chinese he has, been, he has, in fact, been involved with the, in pastoral work in Hong Kong and we have to find he's there. And he also has broader interest in ethnographic studies that involve such things that even spirits and ghosts, ghosts in Taiwan. He is now currently a uh, visiting scholar at the Center for the Study of Religion and Society, and we're very happy to have him here. I'm also always happy to learn that, he, that my friend, uh, Dr. Weller, is actually your advisor, so that was really great to, to learn. Uh, John Lindblom, to my, to my left, is uh, a student in the Department of Theology in the World Church Program. He's currently completing, I want to emphasize that, completing his dissertation. <laughs> okay. 
You heard me say that again last night. <laughs> Completing is a uh, which is called a Chinese tunic for Christ, John C. H. Wu's classical Bible translation. In the February edition of Church Life Journal, he published an essay that you may want to look for online, uh, which deals with the recent reports on Sino-Vatican negotiations, raising many complicated questions that involve Taiwan, and all uh, Hong Kong, and a lot of other things that we know well talk about. So I want to make sure we recognize John. I'm also very proud and excited to have uh, two of the graduate students I work with on this panel. I remember I had that experience before. It's been great. It's great to have them. In fact, this close. It's great. So, uh, <coughs> Jin Liu is a professor of French, and she's the coordinator of the Global Studies Program at Purdue University of the Northwest, which is Calumet, I guess, or something like that. I think that's what we call it. Uh, she speaks, I mean, she works in French language. Literature, culture, and her, her real, I'd say her magnificent obsession besides religion in China is the French Enlightenment. And she has a very, I think, a deep personal connection by virtue of the uh, elective affinity for study of Voltaire. So I think in many ways she moves from Voltaire to the Vatican to the great news. And we're very glad to have her She's also uh, someone who has been working in cultural, cultural relations and global religious studies and has contributed to the Taipei's Ricci Institute which is, may well be another effect of what happens in the debates that go on in China currently. And she's a partner of the Catholic magazine Global Falls. So uh, we're very happy to have her. Megan Rogers, to my left, completed her doctoral degree, completed her doctoral degree <laughs> this year with a rather phenomenal dissertation, a truly phenomenal. Faiths and Fortune, Religion, and the Professional Middle Class Contemporary China. She's in the midst of revising this while serving as a postdoctoral fellow in the Center for the Study of Religion and Society. And she undertook a very ambitious bit of field work here in Suzhou among Buddhists, Catholics, Muslims, and Protestants in the course of her study. And she's, one of the great strengths of what she does is she's focused, I'd say, more meaningfully upon a phenomenological study of religion in China that's grounded in the actual practices of followers. She is someone who works out of the concrete and does not just speculate and so distant way about uh, matters that pertain to religious practice. And so she has much to offer. I want to introduce all of us by saying that uh, we should keep in mind the following quote from John Lajerway, which I think sets very nicely our broader discussion here. Writing in his book, China, a Religious State, he says the following. When I speak of China's religious state, I mean something very concrete. China is a space, and all space in China is conceived of as sacred that is inhabited by divine energies, which because they sustain us, must receive and return out of sacrificial recognition. Whatever be the level at which we approach China, the same definition applies. China is a continent of spirits. We can no longer pass off as mere metaphor notions like the son of heaven or the heavenly mandate. We are the metaphors we live by, which we know from Lakoff, and we are the stories we tell. So we'll pursue these stories now by opening with uh, Megan, who will go first, and we'll begin with the remarks, followed by Michelle, then Jim, and then John. I want to stress this, several things. Please have your phones off or trash <coughs> can or something so it's not really uh, uh, around. I'm going to use my phone to make sure people keep to seven minutes of commentary, and that should leave us then with about a little bit over 30 minutes for discussion. So I really hope that uh, you can stay for that, and uh, we'll proceed. So. Megan, if you'll go, we'll Thank you. Uh, I'm seeing my role here today as sort of setting the stage, giving some background information on um, religion in China as a whole, since unlike my fellow panelists, I am not an expert in Catholicism. So um, I want to start off by sort of looking at or thinking about the kinds of news stories about religion in China that we see here in the U.S. Now, granted, I have not taken a comprehensive or um, early academic you know, survey of the news stories, but my general impression is that they generally fall into three categories. They talk about the government control of religion in China, uh, government repression of religion in China, particularly persecution of re religious individuals, um, especially uh, Christians and Tibetan Buddhists, which is very interesting, tells us a lot about us that um, uh, Uyghurs and Muslims in China don't get nearly as much coverage. Um, and then finally, just generally about the rise of religion in China, um, but especially Christianity. And so all these uh, three 
topics have truth in them, but they're not the whole story. And they don't tell us a lot about um, sort of like just your ordinary um, individual's experience of religion on the ground in China. And that's really my own academic interest, and so I'm going to try to direct our attention a little bit to uh, in that direction, while also uh, laying out a little bit of historical framework. Um, and so let's start with the theme of government control. Uh, one thing to, on, to start off I want to emphasize is that um, I think a common misconception is that government control of religion in China is this particularly communist thing. And it's not. It has a long history in China. <coughs> Imperial China, uh, Republican China, there was some form of uh, government control of religion. Uh, and if you think back, those of you who know the Chinese rights controversy, the Catholic Church provides a great example of that, which perhaps uh, we will have a chance to discuss further. And so what's different about uh, the uh, communist government is their um, emphasis on atheism, of course, and uh, the sort of the Marxist bent that um, the view that religion um, will naturally fade away um, and of course, they've taken different approaches to, well, we're going to make it fade away right now, or to, um, well, it'll eventually naturally fade away. And so uh, the government, um, Chinese gov uh, communist government uh, declared five official religions. Uh, Catholicism, and the fact that Catholicism is considered a separate religion is important, and hopefully I'll have a chance to go back to that. Uh, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Protestantism, and Islam. And so they all have patriotic associations that um, sort of link the religious communities to the government. Um, and so there were a lot of major effects, uh, not just on Christianity, and I'm sure most people know there are registered and unregistered communities, both in Protestant and um, Catholic uh, churches. And they also had important effects on um, Buddhist and Taoist communities, which I don't have time to go into right now, but I'm happy to talk about later. Um, and then another thing to remember is that um, the understanding of religion, religious freedom is different than our contemporary general American understanding in that uh, the Constitution um, provides Chinese people with freedom of belief. And belief is key there. You can think whatever you want in your head, but you don't have freedom to gather with your fellows, which I get into lots of extended discussions with um, Chinese leaders about this, about whether religious freedom necessarily includes um, the freedom to gather and worship together. And also to keep in mind, in the back of all this is uh, a strong and uh, valid concern that about um, foreign inter interference in China, which uh, just looking at China's history over the last um, couple, couple centuries, um, we can see where they're coming from. Um, but this does uh, put a lot of extra pressure on Christians and Muslims because these are seen as foreign religions. And of course, Catholicism is especially problematic since it is by nature um, linked to a foreign entity. And so, and, but I also want to mention this government control can play out in ways we wouldn't necessarily anticipate, such as in my uh, field site in Suzhou, the local government provided funds to build new churches. Uh, the Buddhist and Protestant communities are self-sustaining, but the Catholic and Muslim ones are not. And so the government supplements the income of the religious leaders so that they, these communities can actually have religious leaders. Okay, religious repression. Um, it's varied over the course of uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, the high point was, of course, the Cultural Revolution. And now one thing that's really important to remember is that it varies by location. So when we hear about a church, um, for example, being torn down in Hunan, which apparently happened uh, very recently, or um, uh, religious individuals being jailed, that doesn't mean it's happening all over China. Uh, the central government issues its mandates, and then local governments have um, a degree of discretion in applying them. And so, um, and a lot of it dep depends on maybe their personalities, their priorities, and also the political skills of the local religious leaders. And um, I also want to emphasize that for all our talk about religious repression, that doesn't mean it's about on the forefront of ordinary practitioners' minds. Certainly some groups. Um, but just you know, talk to the average Buddhist or um, sometimes even average Protestant, it's, they're not too concerned about it. They're concerned about you know, um, growing as Buddhists, as Protestants, Protestants and living out their religion in um, everyday life, which can be 
difficult in, for example, the workplace. And so, um, finally, uh, the rise of religion. What are we talking about there? Here in the US, we usually mean uh, the rise of organized religions, particularly Christianity. Um, really, the rise is more um, the return of popular practices that aren't not generally referred to as religion, um, but pervade people's lives. And uh, an important thing to remember about the rise of Christianity specifically is that it's the rise of Protestantism. <coughs> Catholicism outnumbered Protestants when at the founding of the People's Republic, but now the situation is completely reversed. Uh, Protest or Catholic population has pretty much grown with the Chinese population, whereas um, Protestantism has quite a few converts. And um, I don't really have a chance to go into this in much detail, but I'm happy to talk about it. One important thing to remember is that Catholics are not on people's radar in China. Uh, you talk to the ordinary person, they're like, well, it's one of our major religions, but I've never met a Catholic. So um, backing these concerns about um, the Vatican and Chinese relations, ordinary people don't care. Or not, they don't care. They don't even know that it's an issue. And I'll end on that point. Thank you. Okay, local is sovereign. All right, we'll turn now to Michelle. Thank you, Megan. So I would like to contribute to our discussion today by going back to what many of you have may seen in the newspaper about a potential agreement coming up soon between the Vatican and Beijing. Um, indeed, if you go back to the newspapers in 1994, you will find the same story. <laughs> and again and again, almost every three years. Um, but nonetheless, what's new is that since uh, Pope Francis uh, is in office, he has tried to reorganize things about how the church deals <coughs> with China and prioritize uh, the relationship with China. Um, this last 30 years, because there is no uh, diplomatic relationship between the church and China, many people, uh, many, mostly clergy member and top rank official inside the church, uh, stepped in and tried to be the mediation between the church and China. And all of them have their own view, and um, the Vatican got very conflicting views about how should we deal with uh, the, the Chinese government. So with Pope Francis, what happened is that he said, when it comes to the state-to-state -state relationship, it's the job of the Secretary of State. So all the other people, including cardinals, sorry, but that's not your job. So in order to improve the dialogue between the Holy See and China, it's going to be the job of only a small group, only people who are at the Secretary of State. And of course, this new policy is frustrating to many people, and especially those who were very active in this uh, discussion and dialogue uh, between uh, the church and Beijing. So what you read in the newspaper, it echoes to this frustration, and a lot of rumors about what are these discussion and agreement about. And, um, and indeed, we don't know. So that was my first point. Um, but, then what I would like to emphasize is that we should not miss the forest because of one tree. Even if this tree is the question of the bishops in China or the question of politics. There are a lot of things going on among Catholics in China and I do believe that they deserve our interest. So I would like to give only three examples. Uh, the first one is about the tremendous and very rapid urbanization of China. China is going, you, I'm sure you all know that, is going through a, a gigantic <coughs> social transformation in terms of space and social organization, and have gigantic cities today. And of course, this is impacting the way in which Catholics organize themselves. So one example that I just want to mention is about how many lay people, migrants, who left their countryside 20, 30 years ago, have today recreated all kind of unofficial, not underground, unofficial networks and opened chapels all across uh, large cities in China. And often with the blessing of the local official bishops who is not allowed to build new churches or not as many as you wish. So we have a huge contribution of the lay 
successful patrons who have money and who have been uh, used to move from different space to create a new uh, religious space among urban China. And that's a major shift inside the Chinese Catholicism. That's the first example. Second example that we should not uh, ignore is that today the church in China is going through a very important crisis in terms of religious vocation. It's as bad as in Europe. And no one talked about that, but that's a major challenge. Seminaries are closed down not just because of the government, of course, but also because there is no candidate. And um, so that's for the priest. But for the nuns, we have also all kind of things going on. So um, we had um, uh, female religious orders in China. They recruit a lot of people in the 90s. Today it's done. Uh, but the position, the function, the contribution of these nuns is under major negotiation. They have all kinds of constraints coming from the transformation of China, the, so the Chinese society, but also coming from the church itself. The relationship with local parish priest is far from easy, and the nuns refuse more and more to be the servant of the priest, because they've been able to come here, Notre Dame or Boston College, and get a PhD. So laundry is not necessarily the most attractive things to do when they back to a parish life. And we don't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> religious life and religious vocation are crucial for the daily existence of the church in China. Um, so I, I love and I care about bishops, but the church is not just bishops. Uh, the last point, to echo to what Megan mentioned earlier, but also to the quotation of John Lagerway, it's about buildings and uh, pilgrimage sites. These last 30 years, Catholics, most of them being lay people, have been able to rebuild or build a lot of sites and make Catholicism tangible, <coughs> physically present. <coughs> and I don't want to go through the book of uh, John Magoway, but in terms of space, in terms of reality, uh, the church today is present through many ways. and. Um, so the action of all kinds of actors, and it's not just clergy members or lay people, but also through the site. Uh, there are very powerful, influential, attractive pilgrimage sites in, uh, in, across China, and they are well known by Chinese Catholics, and they perform something in terms of strengthening the church. And we don't talk about that. We don't care. Um, I know for Americans, pilgrimage is not priority, but for Europeans, we do believe that pilgrimage are very beneficial for the life of the church. And today, we see that coming back in China. So I just want to bring our attention to that. In conclusion, I just want to repeat myself. We should not miss the forest because of one tree, whatever the tree is. Thank you. That is terrific. We're all keeping calm. This is great. So I think there are some handouts. Uh, in the crowd here, you might be able to share uh, that uh, Jen is very is relevant to her uh, presentation, so we should have that, and then if so, then we'll proceed. Okay. I first want to thank, I first want to thank uh, Megan for providing the broad context of religions in China, and then for Michelle for sharing, okay. for sharing the results of his field research in China. <laughs> <coughs> beyond, well, it's on, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. beyond the noise, cycles <laughs> <laughs> of the ever, 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 ever repeating media headlines. The current division within the Catholic Church in China reflects deep historical wounds, which we do not have time to examine today. I would like to illustrate my points by telling the story of a young Chinese priest. He was ordained a priest on June 7, 2017, last year. One of the only four new priests who had finished their courses before Shanghai's Shoshan Seminary was closed in 2012. When I first met him, he was still a seminarian. On May 21, 2014, while spending two weeks with lecturing at Fudan University in Shanghai, I visited the Basilica of Our Lady of Shoshan and the Shoshan Seminary with this young seminarian. 
It was just a few weeks after the canonization of Pope John XXIII and the Pope John, John Paul II. And the Mary Month usually brings large numbers of tourists and pilgrims to Shershan. As I chatted with the seminarian outside of the Basilica, he told me how to tell which people around us were government security agents. He said, we know who they are, and they know who we are. We just live like that and do not bother each other. Let them watch us. We have nothing to hide. When I asked him if his given name, Yong, means courage, he smiled humbly and said that if he were courageous, he would work for the underground church. No, his name means eternity. I like the word eternity too, and I think there's also a tremendous courage in the radical openness and profound sense of peace that he showed. He came from a family that had been Catholic for many generations in a Catholic village where all his relatives and families are Catholic. Many of them belong to the underground church. When they found out that he was to become a priest in the official church, they asked his parents, how could you let your son become a traitor? He spent hours having lunch with me and two other researchers, and then showing me around the seminary. The seminary was nearly empty, as it had remained closed since 2012, after Thaddeus Madachin, who had been approved as bishop both by Beijing and the Holy See, announced his resignation from the Chinese Catholic Patriotic Association during his episcopal ordination on July 7, 2012. <coughs> My host had what it takes to be a good priest, gentle, patient, and attentive, with two qualities rarely combined, cautiousness and openness. He was a great fan of Pope Francis, he told me. Pope Francis speaks to our heart in a way that is easy to understand. He was also emphatic that their heart was with Rome. My story can serve as a microcosm micro of the complex situation of Catholicism in China. The seminarian who was working for the government-sanctioned open church comes from an old Catholic family with members who belong to the underground church. He was walking a fine line by working in the official church and remaining faithful to Rome. Shoshan Seminary was established in 1982 with the Jesuit father, Jin Luxian, the late Bishop of Shanghai as its founding rector. It was there that under Jin Luxian's arrangement, Cardinal Joseph Zen taught between 1989 and 1996 and celebrated the first Chinese language mass on September 30, 1989, nearly a quarter of a century after the Second Vatican Council. Jin Luxian became the Bishop of Shanghai in 1985, first without Vatican's approval, therefore technically an illicit bishop, but was subsequently recognized in 2005. He collaborated closely with Shanghai's underground bishop, Fan Zhongliang, both of them Jesuits. I would like to end by highlighting the following issues, which I believe have not received enough attention in American academic circles. One. How to ensure that the priest can receive good theological training in well-functioning seminaries so that they can provide a pastoral care to new generations of Catholics. Because the new generation of Catholics, a lot of them are well-educated and they need spiritual food that's of high quality. Two, how can the Catholic Church address Chinese people's spiritual needs in a rapidly changing and increasingly materialist fractured and polarized society? How can the church itself become a model for how to disagree in charity, how to live with the religious others in a pluralist society with an ecumenical and interfaith spirit? How to help Chinese people know more about the Catholic Church post Vatican II, as well as Pope Francis' spirituality, as large number of people held a dated view of the church, calling the popes emperor of religion, Jiao Huang. Three, how can the Chinese Catholic Church play a more active role in the society, effectively carrying out operation in order to realize the mission to allow the neighbors in the area of aging care, environmental protection, and the solidarity with the poor? 
how can it become a field hospital to borrow from Pope Francis? I, I, I want to end my part by again quoting Pope Francis, time is greater than space. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Right? John? Okay. Uh, sir, no. Use it real. Is it on? Hello? I don't know if it's on. Is it on? No. I don't think so. So don't worry about it. Okay. okay. Um, thanks. Um, I want to thank everybody else for what they have said so far, which really sets the stage for the situation. I would like to make a few comments about um, the more recent things that have been in the news and, and present a couple of perspectives. Um, but first, um, well, first I'll share one or two quick personal encounters of my own. Um, the first time I had, uh, I had been in China for, for two years and uh, spent those two years attending masses in an official church in the city of Chengdu and I kind of got to know how that church operated a bit. And then the first time I ever met an underground Catholic was in 2004 um, on a visit to the tomb of Matteo Ricci in Beijing, in which I was with a Catholic group. And this man, this Chinese man, showed up and just started praying at Ricci's tomb. And I began talking with him, and I learned that he was an underground Catholic, had lived in Beijing all of his life, um, and had seen you know, the whole communist revolution and then been through the cultural revolution and had really gone through the, the suffering that you hear from underground Catholics and official church Catholics um, throughout China. This man in particular, in subsequent months, I became friends with him, and he told me that he had had 14 relatives killed by the communists, including a brother of his who had been a priest uh, killed in the 1950s. So as a, as a foreigner or as anybody hearing a story like that, of course, I'm deeply sympathetic with him. And then I heard similar stories from Catholics in the official churches. One man in particular, first time I met him, he didn't even know me, but he shared that uh, some of his family had been killed by the communists. So Catholic, older Catholics, whether they're in the unofficial or official, have been through those kinds of suffering, many of them. Um, a friend of mine, Anthony Clark, who's a scholar of Chinese history and particularly the Catholic Church, uh, writes something that I want to quote briefly. It's about the question that he said, the most frequent question he gets, and this is true for myself also, is, you know, what's the difference? What's going on? What's the underground church? What's the official church? What's that whole situation about? Everybody's concerned about that, and rightly so. And Anthony wrote this, and, and I cannot say it any better than this. He said, uh, aren't there two communities in China, a true church that exists underground and a false church that is run by the Communist Party. This assumption has been disseminated for several decades, and it has served more to confuse than to clarify the reality of one but somewhat divided Catholic Church in China. There is no such thing as a state-run Catholic Church in China. There is a state-monitored association, the CCPA, Patriotic Association, that was established to oversee how Catholics worship. The tension in China, if there is much tension at all nowadays, between the so-called underground and above-ground Catholic communities has not been about whether one community is more or less Catholic than the other, but rather around the question of, in quotes, selling out to state influence over the day-to-day -day operations of Catholic life, especially regarding the issue of how bishops are selected and ordained. Chinese Catholics view themselves as part of one suffering Catholic church that is still working out how its two communities can come to an agreement about how to best practice the Catholic faith under a communist government. And I think that is really true. Another experience I had was going to a mass in a Catholic village in which the uh, underground or unofficial Catholics and the official Catholics had mass together. They were taking seriously Pope Benedict's call from 2007 for the two communities to reconcile and to come together. So these two communities were actually in the process of rebuilding their church, which had been destroyed uh, in the 1960s during the Cultural Revolution, and they were coming, coming together to rebuild their church with the intention of, of, of sharing it together. And on that particular occasion, 
that mass was celebrated by an official priest and an underground priest together. So um, Lionel had mentioned in our discussion yesterday, the term underground can be somewhat misleading. It really is more, could more accurately be called unregistered or unofficial. There have been some times and places where the underground Catholics really have been had to be secretive, but nowadays and in recent years, it's more often been the case that they they don't have to operate completely in secret, but their activities are not registered. So they're not recognized by the government. They may or may not have their own church building. The underground mass I went to, the not the one I just mentioned, but the, another underground mass I went to was in an open outdoor space in a small town. So the local officials, they all knew that they were there and where they were gathering, but they weren't bothering anybody, so nobody was you know, bothering them. Um, so, and then another point is simply that uh, these two community and all the reason why I just said that it's better to call them unofficial than underground, but in Chinese they actually refer to themselves as underground. They use the word Xia, so in that sense that's proper as well. Uh, maybe Lionel can argue with that. We'll both argue, but. Um, but one point is that it's not a clear dividing line either. Some people, a lot of people perhaps, participate in both communities. In some cases, priests or even bishops serve in both communities. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the controversial figures in China has been Jin Lushen, who was Bishop of Shanghai and, and was probably one of, well, he was one of the most prominent bishops in China. And he was an official church bishop um, but some have speculated that he, the fact that he cultivated such good relationships with the central government and with the local government was helpful to the underground community as well. So there's this, in some places, there's tension and conflict between, between the two or between members of the two, and, it's, and sometimes in places there's a degree of cooperation. So all that is to say, um, it's not simple. Um, but also, thank you everyone else for for their comments, and, and uh, I'm sure we'll have more discussion. <coughs> all right, well, I'd like to thank all of you for it. <laughs> so now we're going to open up uh, the floor, so, and I, I hope you'll have questions rather than uh, comments that sometimes we come rather uh, lengthy. So uh, if you could just limit yourself to an actual question or the panel as a whole. Various members of us will respond. So. Yeah. It's a very simple question. What 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 are what is the battle over the? I mean, we, we, it's been said here that we're not exactly sure what the agreement is. But if if there are two or three sides of the agreement, you know what what certain people are afraid of or what have you, what they think might be the case. What are those positions and? I don't know if you have any comments about who, whoever is most. Could, could I offer one sure. comment before? I know both Michelle and John will want to say something about this, but, but there are some there are some known unknowns here, right? <laughs> right? And the first is there are ongoing discussions between the Vatican mm -hmm. and Beijing. All right? right, that we can be sure where we don't know what's happened. Yeah. Exactly, nobody really knows. Right? Mm -hmm. So it means that the status of underground quote-unquote underground churches, which I like to call unofficial churches, are partially registered churches, uh, is something which is in the offing. We don't know about that, what might happen. And then lastly, the possibility of an agreement or a restoration of relations or diplomatic acknowledgement you know, of the Chinese government and Rome, those are all on the table. But there's no agreement mm -hmm. that we can, and I, I think it's very important for us to use our words carefully here, mm -hmm. because it, it could really flame are kind of inflame a certain measure of misunderstanding that I think we don't really have. So I'm just asking that. So yeah, yeah, that's my thought. So yeah, the known unknowns. Keep those in mind. So. As of as of now, there is no agreement. Mm -hmm. But what caused a big surge of co commentary lately was reports of an agreement. Okay. <laughs> so there's been talk of an agreement, but no actual agreement publicly visible. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in recent months, uh, Cardinal Harlan, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, the Vatican Secretary of State, uh, and Cardinal John Tong of Hong Kong 
have been speaking in support of this, this impending agreement, which would resolve the question of how bishops would be selected and then be the first step to an eventual reconciliation between official and unofficial churches. And um, the, in the process leading up to this agreement, an e events were reported in which two bishops in the unofficial church were asked to resign or to step down to make way for two unapproved uh, bishops, meaning two bishops who were installed by the state and not approved by the Holy See. And this caused a lot of um, pain and anger and sadness, sadness on the part, part of both these two underground bishops and underground Catholics in general. And one of these underground bishops went to Cardinal Zen of Hong Kong, retired Archbishop of Hong Kong, and gave him a letter which Cardinal Zen then brought to Pope Francis and asking Pope Francis not to go through with this proposed agreement because, uh, because it would be a terrible thing to ask two faithful, uh, unofficial underground bishops to step down to make way for these two who, who in their eyes are scoundrels and opportunists to take their positions for the sake of creating a diplomatic agreement. In their eyes, that's not worth it. And so Cardinal Zen was very vocal in opposing this proposed agreement on the grounds that um, this isn't a, a fair, equitable uh, agreement. You know, if it goes through in the way that we're seeing, there's nothing good about it from the standpoint of the church. It's a complete cave in from Cardinal Zen's point of view. A lot of people don't agree with Cardinal Zen's point of view uh, or parts of it. So. That has been the cause of a lot of friction. What are we in? I don't know if I should. <laughs> you have too well, much faith to the tree. Okay, <laughs> then you don't, I mean, you don't have to. Yeah. It's it's just, so Cardinal then is a perfect example of the people who is not anymore around the table of negotiation and is extremely frustrated. <coughs> then insulting number two of the Vatican is, in my view, is not really nice from the Cardinal. Uh, talking very bad ways about Cardinal Harlan, then um, criticizing the Pope for asking to a bishop of 85 years old to resign. Nothing shocking in the church. Um, then in the case of this one, the official bishop appointed by Beijing is not a problem. The other case is more problematic, we know that. And uh, so anyway, the Cardinal they make a lot of noise about this case but indeed it's more the other case that is more concerning. But anyway, Cardinal then believes that he's the only one who understands uh, the Communist Party mm -hmm. and is really concerned that the Holy See doesn't pay attention to his uh, view. Okay, so, you yeah. um, For individual Catholics in China, what makes them decide to go to the underground one or the official one? Is it where their parents went or the dynamic of the pastor, level of persecution in that area? Why did they choose to go one way or the other? First, they go to huge cities. Uh, they, they just want to give this example. They go to huge cities, there is no, uh, they, they were extremely busy to find a job to work hard, hard, hard. So it's not black and white, it's not stable. The entire society has been evolving so quickly. So when they migrate to huge cities, First of all, they just pay the rosary and they start going to church. And these last 20 years, they will go, when they will visit their family during the Chinese New Year, they will receive sacraments for many of them. But after the 2000s, they started to create these kind of unregistered chapels where they will gather for a prayer and they will hire a priest visiting them from their hometown once, twice a year. And, uh, but, and now it's far more, um, a strong network, so they are able to gather enough money to have a permanent priest living there. So I have a case study, for instance, when one of these patrons, uh, very wealthy, in a huge city of China, built up a huge shop in one of these modern towers. And the police, of course, came and said, hmm, kind of big. Could you please <laughs> register at least at the police office? So they went to the bishop's official shop, and they said, hey, we need to register. Can we do that? Yes, of course. We already did it for like six or seven of your chapels, so I can do it for this one, no problem. But the priest 
say, no, no, we're not going to register because this shampoo is at least five times bigger than all the other shampoos. So if we register this shampoo, you, the lay patron, are becoming the boss of this network. And that's not okay. It needs a view of it. I'm the pastor here. So, so you see, it's not just about um, underground and official church. It's about power relations between all kinds of lay people, all kinds of clergy members, and in a very, how to say, evolving, changing society. I should know that, oddly enough, there, this, there's a parallel for this that goes back to the Songdans. <coughs> I won't get into it, but this similar battle between the official and having power, local power and wanting to will sort of execute control over how a certain TV should be transmitted and handed down. It's really, it's quite phenomenal. It happened within the Church of Taoism in China for many, many years, the beginning of the 12th century. So. I don't want to talk too much about this case, but for instance, the cathedral in this city um, is a beautiful building. The government paid to renew it, and every single day there are 3,000 tourists visiting the buildings. So the migrants, they say, I don't want to go there to pray. It's, it's commercial. Yeah, it's, it, it, so no, they don't have to pay, but it's just there are so many people. So it, they don't go there, not because they oppose the bishop, or they oppose the official church, it's just that it's not a nice place to pray. So, so that's why they create these kind of private chapels inside the factories, but it gives them also some kind of prestige. And they take over the church, which is a very long traditional a problem of Catholicism of China, which is the privatization of the church. And, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, and one second. Yeah. I think it's just this is. I think Shanghai is a good, a good example of a place where both the underground church and the open church are extremely active for historical reasons. And uh, there, you, there, you can, there are roughly two kinds of Catholic. Catholic who are Catholic because of family traditions. Then they may have the loyalty due to social <coughs> networks. So whichever church they go to depends a lot on the social network and how much resentment they hold against the past grievance. And the newcomers tend to go to the open church. They want past, as I said, they want priests who are well trained and they, the, the quality of the sermon uh, speak to their daily struggle, to their spiritual needs. So there, are, so this situation is complicated, and there are also people who go to both when they have connection to both. For them, it's not like, um, but it's like it's really not like a black and white, a left and right. It's on a spectrum. At the two end of the spectrum, at the one end of the spectrum, you could have underground priest or bishop who thinks that if you go to official church, you're going to hell. I'm quoting someone that uh, if you want me to tell you who it is, I can. But um, I don't. Need, I don't want to make, you know mention the name here. So that's one extreme uh, ex spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, you could also have someone who totally takes the government side, says that uh, you guys got registered. You don't register. You're not a lawful Chinese citizen. That's possible too. But uh, most people are in between. Are uh, somewhere in between on the spectrum. I think that's um, what I see as a reality. Okay, and? Yeah, well, thanks to Pedro for your very informative sharing. I have a question about formation. I'm wondering what is the formation of priests um, in the Christian church and Emperor church? Are they similar to the uh, you know, And how do we whether they are similar to what we do here outside of China? That's the first question. The second formation question out of Catholics themselves, what kind of catechism did they go through? Um, what kind of what? Catechism, you know, how, 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 how did they learn the faith, how did they learn about the doctrines, are there some similarities or differences between the underlying and the future church and to the rest of the world? I mean, that's much variation in the rest of the world too, but I'm curious about whether there is variation, because that for me is really very important, because the priests and you know, how they talk to the commissioners, Influences the beliefs of people. Influences how we understand God and how we behave. So, could you comment on that? Any information to share about that? Thank you. Yeah, comment. So I jump. Um, I'm 
it's required you're not asking about formation of nuns. You're just asking for priests and uh, catechism. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I will address the street on that. So for uh, priests, uh, for the what we call the official church, they were a fair number of official seminaries under the control of the state. The training was has improved a lot this last uh, decade, and they have a fair number of opportunities to go abroad and uh, get further education, as long as they've been through the official training requirement. For the unofficial church, it is far more complex. If they stay inside China, they have a very, very limited um, training, and that was 20 years ago when they have vocations, because today it's done. Uh, so um, many unofficial priests, depending on their personal skills, have a very different training uh, because what their network would provide was rather limited. So um, that's one thing. Um, before jumping on catechism, I want to mention nuns because nuns are not in the radar of the state. So they've been very able to go abroad and get PhD or all kind of degree. And when they come back, they since they live in community, in congregation, they share, it's like a sickness. They spread with all their uh, fellow uh, nuns, all the students that they saw and learned uh, abroad, and then you have a huge gap between parish priests and the nuns. Uh, and we have very strong tensions today between the nuns in China and the priests, because the priests live alone and are kind of God on earth, and the nuns are like, hmm, we have seen kind of different things across the world, and maybe we should change. In terms of catechism, the official church, let's say the official one, have been trying, have been promoting more the Western uh, influence, uh, which is uh, everything has to go through the brain. Um, so let's organize Sunday school, which is for French people the, the scene. <laughs> we don't go to school on Sunday. But <laughs> 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 um, anyway, so uh, they, they do that. Uh, they try. It doesn't work well. Uh, anyway, and the underground church, um, like uh, the network I'm mentioning of lay patrons, they don't believe in it. They're like, no, no, no. We need to create space where our kids practice rituals, where they repeat over and over all the prayers we receive from our family, and they, they do the rosary and they go through. So the training is through the practice of rituals and not through the kind of uh, uh, fake style uh, schooling that we do at through catechism. Sorry. Other comments? Um, I can only add a little bit. I, I'm not deeply familiar with this area, but uh, at the uh, the one time I went to this underground mass, immediately after mass, all the children were forced to sit down on a little stool and take a test. So they had been going through some, you know, some catechism organized by them and taking it very seriously. Um, in the official churches, I don't know what kind of catechism they have for younger people, but whatever it was, it has recently, well, it was outlawed several years ago, but there's a new, this new uh, reports coming out within the last year has been that now they're going to enforce some of these new regulations as of February of this year. And one of those is that uh, children under 18 are not even supposed to go to church. And they're not supposed to have any religious classes allowed. Okay, now that's the official declaration. Everybody knows, or most of, a lot of people here I'm sure know that, you know, the official rule is one thing and then what people actually do is often very different. So. You know, parents and leaders in the churches are going to find ways around whatever those rules are, and I'm sure they're doing it, but I don't know close up what those creative things might be right now. There's a, uh, I'll just mention an article that Lionel had sent around to us. A sociologist named Richard Madsen has done some very good work about uh, Catholics in China, and, and the headline of one of his articles is that um, Christians in China are, or Catholics in China are finding creative ways to get around the state's reach, something along those lines. So, I encourage you to look for that. Okay, let's take another question. All right, over here, the side of the room. Hi, uh, this question is for Megan, kind of directed at Megan, but anyone else uh, feel free to answer. So, you talked about how the government distinguishes between the Protestant uh, faith and the Catholic faith. So, my question is, why do you think they do that, and what are the implications of doing so within, within each? Well, I don't know the history behind why, but um, perhaps some of you can speak to that. Um, 
I'm particularly interested in the implications with, in order, among you know ordinary people, in that it's pretty much accepted. I can not tell you, at least on the Protestant side, I cannot tell you how many times I was talking with Protestants and Catholicism came up since you know I'm at Notre Dame. It does more than it would I otherwise. Um, and they're like, Catholicism, they worship Mary, right? Aren't they a cult? <laughs> and uh, it, it was like, they were, they were very surprised when I explained that we consider, um, you know, Protestantism and Catholicism to be under the same sort of roof of Christianity, so to speak. And so um, part of that way that, that plays out is that, at least I don't, can't speak about the clergy, but among ordinary people, Protestants aren't like strong supporters of um, what Catholics are are trying to accomplish um, because they just, it's a separate religion. And there's also a historical reason when Catholicism was spread to China and there was a part of the, part of the Chinese rights controversy involving the name of the religion and eventually it was translated as the Tian Zhu Jiao and then the Protestant went and the name that took it, Ji Du Jiao. So lots of, for people who are uneducated on the issue, they do they do think the world, those are two different religions. And uh, there are people also, especially on the Protestant side, there are lots of misunderstanding about the Catholicism. It's like I, when I told people that Catholic Catholicism believe in Trinity, they said, "No, what are you kidding? Where does Mary? You know, you can either marry, so there's a, it's not Trinity." And to to explain that is like a it's a very, it, you don't know where to even to start explain. I should note, I have to note this because I think it's important we do so. Uh, Tianzhu, the term Tianzhu was actually, Ri Qian, his letters to the Vatican uh, points out that uh, when they were once away, Ri Qian, Ruggieri, and several other uh, members of their small community of, of Catholics uh, were, were away, and in fact, making an effort to get Franciscans out of imprisonment. Uh, they were out, they were away for a number of days, and one of the young acolytes, uh, if you'd like to call him that, who was studying with a 13-year-old uh, uh, student with, uh, of the, uh, becoming a student of the faith, created a little um, a wooden plaque like he would for ancestors and wrote on a tin. And that was actually encountered by Richie when he returned from that uh, time away. And, and he felt that it had been a very appropriate way to go about understanding as it was for him, the accommodation of both the foreign religion and the native. Of course, we should believe all along that there was a kind of Catholic understanding of the world among uh, most all Chinese by Paul. But what I want to just stress here is the nature of how the church was, even in the way it defines its focus of its attention, began out of the offering of someone who's actually a, a Chinese, who did so in the context of them, what we might consider to be the ancestor cult of but, so keep that in mind. It's a, a very important thing, I think, for us to remember. Uh, okay. Susan? I, I wanted to just see if Professor Schumpel would say something about practice versus belief. And as an anthropologist, there's sometimes discussion of orthodoxy and orthopraxy. And I wonder, in the Chinese context, where religious practice has been so powerful, if the Catholic Church now is um, aiming one way or another in terms of how it's trying to support the practitioners. And I, maybe the question doesn't make any sense, but if you could just, you, you mentioned Sunday school and this kind of school learning versus ritual and practice, so I wonder if you could elaborate. So in the 90s, it's indeed the official church that had been the fastened one to implement the new orthodoxy of the Catholic Church in terms of um, mass and liturgy. Uh, and then later on, the underground one, who was supposed to be the most faithful one to Rome, finally fell out. So in the context of China and the Catholic Church in China, you see how it's complicated to define what is the orthodoxy. Mm. Um, so, 
making things like black and white is helpful to introduce <laughs> the topic, but then the more you get in, in it, the more you see it's not that simple. Uh, but I do think and believe that practice comes first mm -hmm. uh, among Chinese people a lot. And even, for instance, we forget, as French people and American, that uh, saying the rosary in Latin works, in English or in French, it doesn't. It can be cut to grass uh, because the language is not um, working as well as that. Uh, so in uh, the old, uh, the Chinese prayers in Fujuhao, in local dialects, they work. They, are, they create peace and rest. But in modern language, it doesn't work as well. But anyway, we can talk out about that. I'm sorry. Yeah. A lot of the politics of this reminds me of the underground Donatist Church in North Africa in the first century, and the government church, otherwise known as the Roman Catholic Church. And, and, and it was represented by Augustine. Very similar in some ways. I mean, you're talking about Augustine back in those days? Yeah, that's part of Augustine was the one forcing the Roman Catholic belief. Donatist Church in North Africa oh, in the early first century. Um, but what I wanted to ask is, are, are there, do we know people who are communists and also members of the Communist Party and also Catholic? That would be very interesting in terms of late antique parallels. Do we know of any, or is that, I, I suppose there are not many in it. Yeah, was it? there are. Yeah. Um, officially, the party says that no party member is allowed to believe in any religion. But the reality is that there are many party members who practice various religions, uh, including Catholics. Um, and you know, you wonder why? Why would someone do that? Um, the party, obviously, it's an atheist party. They want all the members to be atheists. But a lot of Chinese people approach party membership as simply a practical matter. This is just something you do to get ahead in society or to get a job or, or whatever. Um, and sometimes, some cat, well, I, I worked with one Catholic uh, charitable foundation and they had some party members among their staff who were also Catholics. And those people were the ones who kind of dealt with relations with the local government. So being party members, having party members in your organization could kind of help things go more smoothly. And one time I got in trouble with the police because they didn't register me to be staying at their residence, which, which violates a law. Um, and so they hauled me into the police station and so they sent, they sent their kind of top guy, who I'm not certain he was a party member, but he probably was a party member. And he came with me to the police station. He's the one who did all of the talking to the police. So that kind of thing. Um, I'll also mention, it may have been mentioned here, but just briefly, I mean, an, uh, I met one underground priest who I met, um, had good, said he had good relationships with the local Communist Party officials, and he sometimes had dinner with them, and they sometimes had dinner with him. And so, um, you know, people try to, various arrangements to, to get along. That's yeah. a bit of a long answer to your question. Though. Uh, from just from personal, experience. I lived in China for 25 years before I came to the States. And I had experience where I was approached by party leaders and, uh, and invited me to apply to become a party member. And uh, I said that, I said, I, I, I cannot in good conscience uh, uh, write the application because I don't believe in the one, two, three, four uh, article of faith that I'm supposed to write about. They said, Oh, never mind that. We want to reform the party because that's the only uh, that's the only party in power. So we want to reform it. We want it to become better. So we want good people to be in the party. And then and I said, uh, what you said makes sense, but I just can't write that application form. Then another very helpful person friend said, Oh, you can just copy my application form. <laughs> 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 and I said, uh, I. I, I, I three minutes, <laughs> I still can't do it. <laughs> so, but would I be a bad person if I did? There, I mean, people, people are telling me, you're going to have less opportunity 
opportunity for promotion. And every, all the opportunities, uh, you will be behind. Everybody else will get ahead of you. And think about that. So that's, I could say that, that motivation be explain a lot of people joining the party. So not all of them are atheists. And just to add a little, uh, we should avoid um, too individualized approach to this question because I have, especially among Protestants, I studied many cases where the wife is a very devoted, active Protestant, and the husband is a party member in the police or whatever. So we need to look at this question through um, the communities or the network these people belong to um, in terms of family kinship, uh, because in the family you have all kinds of position and they support each other, or in terms also of the classmates, potentially. That's a very, very strong category for Chinese people. That's like the Roman Empire, too. So there are all kinds of allegiance. The emperor's alive is Christian. Yeah. And I want to pause for a second, Nelson, uh, because Don Saluto wanted to make an announcement. I'll make sure that you can make your announcement. Uh, if there are any undergrads who would like to participate, there's a seminar tonight that Professor Liu is offering on this topic using the power of a narrative and conversion experiences. And we have five more spots left for the seminar. So if you're an undergrad and you'd like to, to join it, come see me as soon as we're done. We'll get you signed up. Okay. No, thanks, on. Back on. And by the way, I have to let you know that we're at 132 now. So we're, we still have time to remain here. But uh, we have people who have class with three o'clock. But anyway, go ahead, Nelson. I wonder if uh, any of you could comment on uh, the extent to which the church is either the underground or the uh, official church engages in the social mission of the, uh, the church and how the state views those activities? Yeah. I worked for about a year with Dinda Charities, which is the official church, one of the official churches uh, legally registered, and this one was the first legally registered Catholic NGO in China. And so they, um, you know, they, they uh, arranged, uh, you know, through whatever whatever difficulties they've had to navigate, they've arranged to legally operate, and they do uh, some very good projects in terms of disaster relief for floods or earthquakes, um, elderly care, they have kind of an, a, a home to care for the elderly, uh, AIDS education and help for people with AIDS, um, scholarships for students, and a couple of similar charitable projects like that, and they are connected with worldwide Catholic relief services, Caritas, and those networks. So that, that's one, one example. example. There are probably a few others throughout China also. Michelle, I'm sure knows. So two more. things. Uh, the state is pushing really, really strongly all religious organizations to open uh, elderly homes. So Protestants have been really good at that. But also today, uh, Catholic churches, so uh, religious holders, are not open an elderly home next to their uh, mother house, or uh, local parishes will do it and that's very pushed by the state. Um, not finance, but pushed. Um, and the other example is a wedding, which is the largest, um, it's not an NGO because it's, it's linked to the state, but it was Catholic, it's still Catholic in the spirit, and it's taking care of the mentally disabled people. And today it's uh, nationally, it's, co it's, it's covering the entire China, it's, it's huge, it's taking care of thousands and thousands of mentally disabled people totally left behind the modernization of China. Okay. Yes, George. Um, what are the chances of reunification? I mean, in the next three, five or ten years, can you give us a, an idea about how maybe the official church and the non-registered church uh, will come together? Um, if you look at what's coming from the top, of the party, the, the party, uh, Xi Jinping and top officials seem to be wanting to tighten control over religions in China, which uh, I think makes it less likely that the official and unofficial groups will come together in the near future. Um, but I don't really know. And if we were having only two groups, maybe that would be possible. But since the Catholic landscape is far more divided than that, with all kinds of factors, um, yeah, I don't think we will have any yeah. clarifications. Uh, it looks more like a minefield sometimes when you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> really think about it. Yep. Okay. And 
think about just a mere diplomatic relationship of the Vatican by Beijing. What would that mean then for Taiwan? And, and Hong Kong. And, and Hong Kong, yes, as well. So we end up being in this, we have this triangulated you know, difficulty, at least at a minimum, just you know, speaking about the past protocol, institutional links, it's history. So it's all, uh, and that's got to be, I mean, think, figure it out. Or we decide that uh, the Vatican has its beliefs, it's so important to relinquish any concern about that, is just simply let it go. But I don't know, I don't see how that's going to happen either. So it's, that's why I think this, it's premature to talk about agreements. I think it's important to keep your eye on the prize of just simply the discussion that has happened at all, which is what Pope Francis had wanted when he visited Korea. He stated how much he wanted to be able to go and have a negotiation and begin real discussion about what could be done with the church in China. So, anyway, all right, other, I'll show you. Um, yes, so I'm wondering, like, what would be your anticipation of the resources and powers to um, bring remedy to the spiritual poverty that would we witness um, back in China, like in relationship with the Catholic Church. Yeah. Can you um, can you can you rephrase your question again? I didn't. Yeah. Hear. Um, you, was it a question for me? We didn't hear it clearly. Uh, really Sorry. Um, it's a question for all. Like, I would love to hear about from you too. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of just curious what what. Mm, what kind of forces is foreseeable in the future that you can see from, like, say, American academia recognition or individual, like, Catholic converts, Chinese, um, coming back to China? Like, what are some of the needs of spiritual poverty that needs to be fulfilled um, in the future? Like, I guess nuns could be one way, <laughs> but academia could be one way. Um, I'm just kind of curious, where do you see the most lacking um, want there is in the Chinese society? I don't know. I, I'm a graduate. I have a PhD from Boston College. Over the years, I received some publications from Boston College. At the beginning, I didn't pay attention to them. But the little by little, I started to read them. And I, and I have to say that in recent years, I started to like them so much. And that I wish that we have those kind of publication in China. And I also know that most of them do not concern politics. And those are spiritual, spiritual leading. They are very high quality. And if you ask me, I just ardently hope that China, Chinese people would have access to what I'm reading from Boston College. Probably Notre Dame has um, and publication like that for alumni too. We do. <laughs> it's, it's, far, it's far more intensive politics. <laughs> Other points, observations, pronunciamentos, John, you want to? I think an uh, I think an institution like I know a university can provide educational opportunities and publications. You know, in the case like, for example, if there's a university press that could provide wonderful printed resources. <laughs> um, there have been actually some uh, Chinese Catholic uh, clergy leaders coming to Notre Dame uh, seeking to set up some kind of the theological education for Chinese, mainly for, for clergy as a starting point, but it could eventually become something that lay people could take part in. But as far as the spiritual need of Chinese people and what the church offers, well, we call that evangelization. What does it mean to know God and to know the purpose of your life? And that's something that, you know, at an individual, one individual can have a huge uh, beneficial effect just by being in China and sharing your experience with your friends and, you know, shining as a light for the gospel and all those things that Jesus talks about in the gospels. Um, so. There's no limit to what one individual can do. And there's also a great deal that institutions can do. And I mean, not just one individual, but groups and, you know, living, that's been, you know, the, the, the Catholic Church's offering throughout history is living, um, living your faith together in community and then shining as a light for all around to see and then people are attracted to that. So uh, credible witnesses is one way that it's often phrased. But I will be optimist about uh, poverty. Poverty is good, even the spiritual poverty sometimes. 
Uh, so I will be more optimistic about the situation in China. And also I will insist on their own needs and their own capacity to create a lot. So I mentioned the late veterans earlier. Uh, one point though that the policy could have, and I've already put that on the table many times, is how do we support the church in China to uh, recreate and let the state recognize, legally recognize, religious orders, and not just diocesan orders, but real uh, monasteries and so on. Because right now, it's totally out of the legal framework. There is no space for that. The church is supposed to be just diocese and, um, how to say, uh, administrative entities, parish and diocese, which is not a tradition for the Catholic Church. And that, I think, impacts a lot the spiritual dynamism of the church in general. David? Uh, to speak generally, not specifically about Catholicism, um, with uh, China's growing urbanization, affluence, um, increases in education uh, across the board in terms of religion, there's a lot more uh, global connections um, going on, and this is for Catholicism as well as Protestantism. And so to use um, Protestant examples, um, I was interviewing um, you know, educated professionals in an urban environment, and um, they drew very strongly on international materials. And so, um, you know, one uh, young woman was like, uh, yeah, I listen to Joel Osteen's um, podcast every day. And um, the, the church had study groups using a um, uh, translated version of Rick Hansen's book. And for a lot of people, um, not just Christians, the internet is providing a fantastic sort of introduction to um, uh, religions and so I had people who became devout Buddhists because they were going through troubles and typed in on um, Baidu that you know how do I change my destiny and they encountered uh, Buddhist teachings and uh, became very uh, devout that way. Yes. Uh, my question is whether you think um, the Chinese government will take advantage of um, Christianity in the future. Like when we, I was read the survey, and when we look at the demo, uh, demographic of the uh, Christian people in China nowadays, um, the representative image of the Christian is like a 49 year old um, women in the countryside China without much education, and like an important uh, function of um, Christian entity is to fulfill their spiritual needs and also maybe distract them from the social problems and the poverty and um, like the practical problems they need in their real life. And that is actually what the Chinese government criticizes the um, Christianity in Western society about. Like, but like actually um, in a longer, in a, the long term sense, I think um, it's beneficial for the government to take advantage of the religion and to control the countryside people. So although it is like contradictory to the ACSM creed of the Communist Party, do you think there is a possibility of the uh, government to take advantage of uh, the religion? Yeah, yeah I, I mentioned earlier uh, the problem of uh, elderly homes. So the state is really pushing a religious organization to collaborate and needs of the population. Yet the cliche about the typical elderly woman, uh, older woman, uh, rural, non-educated, that's a very strong cliche from the 90s, totally outdated. I'm still wondering who was spreading that cliche. Um, because when you spend time among Protestants, it's far from that, and even among Catholics. And then I will be, I have a whole chapter in my dissertation about that. And uh, the state should be careful about spreading this kind of cliche because when you look in the countryside, for instance, or no, even in outside city, one of the key way to attract new believers is by sending buses and buses and buses of retired, very old women to funerals, and that touch very deeply the family. And I have many cases of people converting to Christianity because they realize that all these old people really care for their uh, grandmother or whatever. So old people are not just social trash. They have agency and they participate in the construction of the society. Hmm. Well, there are ways in which co-optation work in lots of ways in China. So uh, uh, the commercial face of it, in a way, uh, the propagandistic face of it is a better term. Uh, 
is certainly one thing we have to cope with, but more importantly, it's in fact, all of the vision is organized under these headings, and there's an effort to try to manage it. You have to keep in mind that if you're trying to essentially run a government as Beijing believes it's doing for a country as a whole, which is as diverse and um, unpredictable as it is, we should keep in mind that I think William Faulkner's famous quote about uh, a student asking him when he was a writer in residence in Virginia what his um, what was it like to write a novel? And he didn't really want to answer the question, but he was urged to answer it. He said, well, for me, writing novels like, writing novels like a one-armed carpenter trying to build a chicken coop in a hurricane. Well, that's about what it's like to rule China and to manage it. And that's why, for example, one of the focuses of the current regime has been wait, wait, or uh, stability and maintenance and the idea of harmonizing. These things, if you will, are suggesting that the management is actually quite difficult. And if you stretch the communist skin far enough over a country that for the most part may well have not been for a very long time understanding of such a, a theory, it would suggest that maybe uh, the skin's been pulled too far. Uh, maybe like a balloon that you've blown up too many times and finally now because of uh, have holes in it. But I think we need to stop here and I want to just thank us for the uh, this rather terrific public course of response to the presentations. And I want to thank the panelists for being with us making this all possible. So thank you all for being here, and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh